the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the commemoration of the new martyrs of the Turkish yoke. These are all of those countless scores of Christians who suffered for the sake of Christ under the yoke of the Turkish oppression, beginning with the fall of Constantinople in the 1400s, and really up until this day. We also read this Gospel reading, in which our Lord tells us the following words. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor for your body what ye shall put on. The rest of the reading elaborates essentially on how silly it would be to take care for the body and for what you eat and what you drink. These commemorations, this gospel is connected to the martyrs, and I, I think by the time I finish, maybe you'll see how. It's an important principle. We have to choose one thing to serve, one thing to set our thoughts on, one thing to set our desires on and our hope in. Abba Isaiah says, as one eye cannot look heavenward and the other earthward, you can't look up with one eye and down with the other one. So the mind cannot combine cares for the things of heaven with those of earth. In other words, we can't be focused on satisfying our passions on the earth and also be serving God. We are going to come to a point where we have to choose in a particular moment which one we serve because they're going to demand opposite things of us. So if we delude ourselves that we are serving both, look closer. When push comes to shove, which do you choose? And the answer typically is whichever one your thoughts are on more often. Whichever one you're focused on more often. Whichever one you really yearn for. Our Lord in this Gospel singles out mammon. He says you can't serve God and mammon. What is mammon? It was old, an old Egyptian god of wealth. There's many things that get between us and God. There's our various passionate desires. There's food. There's power. Control over our lives. And there is riches. Why does he single out riches to be the one to focus on right here? The answer, according to some of the fathers, is that riches lead to every other passion. Once you allow yourself to be enslaved to the desire for riches, you fall into everything else as well. St. Basil says, wretched is the one who demands much. Much demanding creates in life an insatiability of desire. A fire has taken hold that consumes all that is to hand, and no one can stop it until it has burned everything up. So it is with avarice. Is there anyone who can stop it? An insatiable desire for everything. Avarice and every passion indeed darkens your mind. And your mind, according to the fathers, is the eye of your soul. And this is what it means at the beginning of today's reading when it said, The light of the body is the eye. If thine eye therefore be sound, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? What the eye is to the body, the source of sight that guides our body on its path throughout this life, Without which, it's much more difficult to walk that path. The mind is for the soul. The mind is the guide for the various powers of the soul, directing them in the right direction. Without a sound mind, it's really, really hard for your desires and your heart 
and your feelings to point in the right direction. The mind here, I believe, is a translation of that, that central part of the soul, the part that is able to directly experience God, not so much the, the reasoning power. But if it's dark and your soul's in turmoil, but if your mind is pure, it keeps your soul pure. And if your mind is pure, according to the Father, is you can only see purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, it said, for they shall see God. You can only see purity. There is purity and there is impurity inside you. But if your mind is pure, you'll see past the impurity. You will focus on the purity. It says somewhere in St. Paul's writings to, to the Philippians, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are, are beautiful, think on those things. If your mind is pure, you will not only, only see purity as you look at, at yourself, you'll only see purity as you look at the world, as you look at the world around you. Here's a litmus test for you. As you look at the world around you, what do you first notice? Do you notice all of the problems? Do you notice when looking at another person, what's wrong with them? Or do you see what's beautiful in them? This beautiful element of God's creation in everything you see around you. That's an indication of how pure your mind is. One of the other saints gives this analogy. In a big field full of beautiful flowers with a garbage heap at the side, where do the bees go? They go to the flowers to get the nectar. Where do the flies go? They go to the garbage heap. Which one do they see? Which one do you see as you look at the world around you? The new martyrs, I promise there was a connection here, right? The new martyrs illustrate for us this notion of keeping your mind pure and what that does. I'm going to read you a story or tell you a story, rather, from the life of the new martyrs Nicholas, Stalmatos, and John. These were residents of one of the Greek islands. On, towards the, off, off the eastern coast of Greece. And they were merchants. They were not, not wealthy, not that well-to-do, but they were merchants, and they traded by sea in the Aegean Sea. And it happened once that there was winds and storms that caused their boat to run aground on the western coast of Turkey in the year 1822. So the western Turkey at that time was, was ruled by the Turks, against, hence the name Turkey. Well, they landed there, and they knew it was a dangerous place being Christians to have landed, so they sought out a Christian family and they, they were living near the coast and they asked for help in repairing their boat and restocking their boat and they paid for it, they gave them money. Well these, these Christians were scared of the authorities, they were scared to be harboring these people, so instead of helping them they turned them in to the local authorities. And they were put in prison. The eldest of four of the people on the boat actually ran into the sea and escaped. The three that remained, the eldest, named Nicholas, was asked to renounce Christ. He said he, he refused. He said, Christ is my Lord. I'm, I was born a Christian. I will die a Christian. And he was beheaded immediately. The other two, Stelmatos and John, were put into a dark prison without any food where they spent their time singing canons and akathists in praise and in beseeching the help of the Mother of God. I don't know if I found myself in a prison, I would know enough of the canons and akathists to be able to say them, not having brought my prayer book with me. Two men were sent by the, by the ruler, by the pasha, to try to convert these two merchants. He promised them rich gifts, and he could somehow convince them to convert and become Muslims. So what did he try? He tried everything. He tried promises of great positions, of wealth, of honors. And he tried threats of torment and punishment, and nothing availed. They said, no, Christ is my Lord. 
I am a Christian. I don't care about your tortures. And I despise the honors which you offer me. Do you see what's happening? Do you see how their mind is pure? They see only Christ. They see only Christ. They're steeped in their love for God and for the Mother of God. That's why they know those canons in Ocathus, right? They must have said them many times. So that they're not tempted by these things that are quite tempting, yes? A comfortable life. Wealth. Ease. And they're not even tempted by the threat of tortures and torments. Because their mind is on Christ and he is the one thing that matters to them. So the, the two men went back to the Pasha and said, well, it's not working. Um, but I think if you let us actually torture them, then we might be able to make a difference. The Pasha says, no, I have too much experience with these Christians. Once they get this stubborn, nothing's going to change them. We're just going to behead them. So an angel revealed that to Simakos and John in the prison, that tomorrow would be their last day. And so they, um, they got a letter. I don't know exactly how this letter was sent, um, but they got a letter to the metropolitan of Chios. Chios was the, 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 the city center that they were imprisoned in. There were Christians there. Right? There was, Christianity was legal, but you were like a second-class citizen. If you didn't cross any boundaries or make any waves, you can kind of get on living. So there was a bishop there. They sent a letter to him with their confession. They wanted to receive absolution of their sins. And they asked him if he could somehow enable them to receive the holy mysteries before they died. Um, so what did the Metropolitan do? Um, priests were not allowed in the prison. Outside Christians were not allowed in the prison. Christians had no rights whatsoever, right? But there was a woman who worked in the prison through whom the bishop sent the holy mysteries to these two martyrs. He sent a letter absolving them of their sins along with the holy mysteries and some words of encouragement for their martyrdom. They in turn sent back thanks and requests that they liturgies be offered on their behalf in the traditional way. When they were brought out to be beheaded, they again were asked, right, will you recant? Will you confess, become a Muslim? And they said, no, we will die Christians. And then the soldiers began to brandish their swords, right? And John began to get faint-hearted. And his, his countenance changed, it says. Well, Simako said, what are you thinking? And encouraged him, right? So they both again loudly proclaimed Christ. They were beheaded, and their bodies were left lying there, scorned, ignored. Christians walked around and were scared to do anything. Were scared to take. There were some Christians who felt who felt that they should be buried properly, right? But they were too scared to do anything about it. Too scared of the authorities. Some other Christians were forced by the Muslim authorities to drag the bodies through the streets, put them on a raft, and shove them out to sea. Others looked on saying, I don't know what they were saying, but they didn't do anything because they were scared. Instead, they asked a Christian man, a lover of God and a lover of the martyrs who lived by the seashore, to watch for their relics to see if they should wash up. So in, in a few days later, so they could bury them properly. So this man, George, indeed, um, he was a tanner, he indeed watched the sea, and he did see the relics wash up several days later. Glory to God. And they found them, and they gave them proper burial. There are many Christians in this story, but there are only a few martyrs. Martyr means witness. Those who witnessed to their faith, those who chose their faith. When that moment came, when the demands of their conscience demanded something different than security in this world did. They chose Christ. They chose their faith in that moment. Why? What makes the difference between them and the others? I would submit to you 
that perhaps it is because they had a pure mind. They had a mind which was focused uniquely on Christ. They were not attempting to serve two masters, God and man. The bishop was a good witness. The woman working in the prison, who risked much to bring the mysteries to them, was a witness. Stimakos and John were witnesses. Where would you be? Where would I be in this story? I hesitate to try to answer where I would be in this story. But I must ask, because it is not inconceivable that we could find ourselves, each one of us in this room could find ourselves in a situation like that, where we are facing a choice of whether to witness to Christ or whether to do what someone in this world demands of us for the sake of comfort, for the sake of wealth, for the sake of our bodily integrity and security, for the sake of a job. Are we willing to confess Christ and to live according to our conscience? If we want to be, I would say the way to get there is to work on purifying our minds. And so I'll say what we say probably 20 times a week. Read the gospel. Read the lives of the saints. Read the lives of the new martyrs. Pray the Akathists and Canons that these saints knew by heart. Just pray. In any way, right? Test yourself and see throughout the course of a day, how often are your thoughts on God? And if they're not, it almost doesn't matter how you do it, but make your thoughts be on God more often. Through something. And he will take care of you. As the Apostle Paul said in the second epistle reading, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. It says in the Old Testament, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect. To him be due all glory, honor, and worship to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.